Chapter 5, Part 11 The Long, Restless Night First of Moonstone, 142 I decided to check and see how our military is progressing. I don't know whether or not to believe these nightmares, but I can be sure that our fortress must be prepared to defend against another assault when it comes. I hear voices coming from the Craftsdorf workshops in the main chamber ahead. So there we were in Clapcraft, making introductions all around, and when they asked me what skills I could bring to the fortress, I told them I was a bone carver. A bone carver, and they believed me. I'd never carved a boat in my life before I got here. I was a wood burner for the last five years before I came here, but I hated it. I knew they wouldn't need any of that here anyway. True story. I walk into the main chamber to see Manuel Calavera chatting with his friend Orange Soda, the two of them taking a break from producing crafts. Upon seeing me, Manuel Calavera suddenly goes very quiet and turns bright red. Orange Soda just grins and waves at me in greeting. I just shake my head and keep walking. I reach the barracks. Royal W has truly done an excellent job of training the recruits, who've come a long way in just a few short months. I watch as Feroz and Spermy Smurf engage in a practice duel, Royal W barking instructions and encouragement. I think I see something else moving out of the corner of my eye. Suddenly I feel a chill in my bones, noticeably worse than the usual chill of this place. I get up and walk out of the barracks and the feeling goes. I... I really need to get more sleep. Arma, damn these nightmares. 24th of Moonstone, 142. Ever since the nightmare started, I haven't slept much most nights. I'm not really sure what the word night really means at the moment, to be honest. The fortress has its active hours and its resting hours, but the sun hasn't shown itself for weeks. I finally fall asleep for the first time in a long while, only to have another nightmare. The demon faces me its voice addressing my mind. Do you really believe that a few soldiers can stop a demigod? Consider your situation, Jasimus. Perhaps I'm closer than you think. Perhaps your actions are just making things worse. The demon vanishes, and I find myself in bed again. 12th of Opal, 142. The peasant, Ultimate Quicks, comes running into my study to inform me of the news. The miners of Syrup Leaf have struck adamantine. My heart begins to race. Perhaps this discovery will make the entire ordeal of overseeing this fortress worthwhile. We can outfit our soldiers such that they will be truly prepared to meet the threat of any invasion. Then, I remember the demon's warning. It had said that it was closer than I had imagined. I rush into the depths of the mines, screaming for the miners to stop immediately. I can be sure that something sleeps beneath the adamantine. That must be the answer of the demon's riddle. There will be no more of that material mine from here while I oversee the fortress. I reach the lowest mine shaft and shout the order to the miners. Rixison, Sewermancer, and the Deadly Mole have already mined out a significant quantity of the material before receiving the order to stop. It's too risky to dig for more, but there is no risk in putting to use that which we have already unearthed. 15th of Opal, 142. As I enter the furnaces to check the status of the production of adamantine arms and armor for our troops, the furnace operator, out of print, and the stranger's finch greet me, a glum expression on both of their faces. What's wrong, I ask? Do you need more time? Uh, it's not that, how to print says. It's just, well, I, I think it has to do with the fact that the magma from our volcano has to travel through hundreds of yards of frozen earth before it reaches the furnaces. Once it get here, it's sort of, well, cooled off a little bit. We haven't had any problems with any of the other metals. No problems with iron. Even steel is fine. But the fires just don't get hot enough to smelt adamantine, the stranger's finch adds. Well, this is just great. Of course, it couldn't have been this easy. Well, what about the ore? Our masons can work that just like any other rock, right? I, I suppose so, out of print replies. 19th of Opal, 142. The Mason Goose Creek carves a series of statues from the adamantine ore. Smuggins, the fishery worker, and Slan, the glassmaker, their own professions not having kept them particularly busy in this fortress, carry the statues down to the crypt of the fallen heroes, where they will watch over the tombs for the rest of eternity. Later, as I sleep, the demon once again visits my dreams. 
In my head, its voice seems to come from every direction at once. Do you think you can hide from me by refusing to dig deeper into the earth? You still don't understand, Jasmus. I awaken with a start. It is so hard to sleep with all of these nightmares. 11th of Obsidian 142 That evening, I meet with Spoonboy, the first leader of Surableaf after its founding five years ago, to discuss the situation over dinner. This is a stack of 32 superiorly prepared hippo meat barbecue. The ingredients are superiorly minced quarry bush leaves, finely minced quarry bush leaves, finely minced quarry bush leaves, and finely minced hippo meat. Fortress chef Joseph Wong KS has prepared an amazing meal featuring exotic meat imported from the humans, which has been spiced with quarry leaves. Spoonboy, having taken up the art of brewing during the past few years, has brought a barrel of his best ale. At least the fortress can get a few things right, I have to admit to myself. You don't look like you've been getting much sleep, Jasmus, Spoonboy says. Something the matter? Oh, it's nothing, just bad dreams ever since the battle. Nothing serious. So, tell me, why was Slon hauled off to jail anyway? Bob the Third had requested that he produce a set of glassware. Slon didn't come through, so Bob the Third ordered him off to jail. But we don't have access to all the resources for a glass industry here, I counter. Spoonboy leans in and whispers, Mayor's like that sometimes. He took a nasty knock to his head during his first year here, and I don't think it ever really healed all the way. I sigh. So, anyway, what do you know about the legend of Holistic Detective? I ask him. Well, as I'm sure you've heard, she was once a mighty dwarven warrior who was eventually corrupted by dark forces. Nobody's sure of the truth, but most agree that the madness started at Headshoot soon after the demons were released from the earth. Some say that Holistic Detective killed all the demons that climbed out of that glowing pit, but others swear that a great demon lord emerged behind the others and somehow took possession of Holistic's soul. I guess we'll never know if that's true. Anyway, what we do know is that things were different there after the demons. A dark cult sprang up in the fortress, and dwarves engaged in dark and dubious worship. Holistic was seen walking across a river of magma without suffering any injury. Just before the fortress collapsed, it said that she would forego the use of her mighty hammer and simply beat her opponents to death with whatever she happened to be holding in her hand at the time. Usually, this would be her brown leather backpack, but uh, a few dwarfs claim to have seen her use other things as weapons from time to time. Bone scepters, masterpiece steel armor, that sort of thing. 29th of Obsidian 142. The face and voice of Holistic Detective speaks to me again that evening. Unlike the other times, though, this is no nightmare. This is real. I've hardly slept at all for the past few weeks, and I haven't fallen asleep yet tonight. At least I... I don't think I have. How can I be sure? Sitting in my bed, I see the face before me. I hear the voice. All of your work has been in vain, Jasmus. The constructions, the mining, the battles, the crafts. All of it is for naught. I pinch my arm and feel the pain. Surely this is no dream. I, I think... A small rivulet of blood runs down my arm where I pinched it, staining the bedsheets. I'm already here, Jasmus. I'm already inside your fortress. I walk among your dwarves, and you cannot even see it. 30th of Obsidian 142 I don't think that I slept at all last night. Strangely, there is no mark on my arm where I remember having pinched it. My mind is in a deep fog. I force myself to walk over to the barracks. I'm so tired. The military situation at Syrup Leaf is much improved. I guess that's good news. Royal W's training has made several of our dwarves into champions already. Sirocco, Spermy Smurf, Swat Jester, Syntax, and Mailman have all been given either an axe or a hammer of steel by Royal W in recognition of their accomplishments. 
Two of the champions are in the barracks right now, in fact, getting ready to spar. The Hammer Dwarf, Spermy Smurf, and the Axe Dwarf, Syntax, face each other down in mock battle, but something is wrong. Their weapons... They should be wielding an axe and... and a hammer. Syntax swings his masterpiece Plate Greaves in a wide arc towards Spermy Smurf, who steps aside and counters by swinging a, a suit of masterpiece plate mail at his opponent. They may as well be wielding leather backpacks. I feel a bitter chill in my bones and the laughter of the demon in my mind. The color drains from my face and my knees nearly buckle under me. I fight to keep from passing out. Dizzily, I stumble down to the furnaces. Frederick? I'm putting you in charge now. I'm gonna need some time to myself to think things over. I walk away without further explanation, leaving the dungeon master with a confused expression on his face. As I walk through the main chamber, I glance out of the front gate to the east. For the first time in months, I see that the sun is rising. Or perhaps that's just a hallucination from lack of sleep. End chapter 5